Among the stories of Westminster Church, I remember hearing a good one about a canoe. In the middle of the night, a couple of guys, I won't tell you which ones, took one of the boats from the riverbank and they hid it behind some trees. It just so happened that the water in the river had come up just a bit that night, so in the morning, one of the tricksters yelled out that the water must have taken the canoe. Well, from his newly uh, awakened reaction, one of the canoers, Ronnie Rice, as I understand it, started in a full-on sprint to go and retrieve the canoe. But the best part of the story is because he was startled so early in the morning, this runner, this runner sprinted upstream to go find the canoe. And moving from the canoe trip to Shenango Lake, there's the one where there was a microburst as fearsome winds came upon a group of faithful campers. It tore tents, ripped down large branches out of the trees. In the morning, some of those tents went right into the dumpster. Some of you could not have even driven out that morning. That was until Glenn pulled out the chainsaw he just happened to have with him. He cut up the down trees and allowing this awful trip to end as everyone was able to finally drive home. Now, one of the campers who was there on that treacherous evening was a young boy. He kept coming each year with his aunt and uncle to Shenango Lake. As he grew up, a small beach that's by the lake where we tie up the boats became a meaningful space of beauty and of life. Just a month ago, that young boy, Sean, who's now all grown up, proposed to his girlfriend, Chloe, on that small beach by the bank of the lake, cementing the story of Shenango into the life of his future family for years to come. We tell stories like this year after year. They become the tales that live on from those who were there sharing the events that occurred. Families have their stories. My guess is your family has its stories too. And likewise, the church family has stories that it passes down from generation to generation as well. When the early Christians heard the, this story this morning about Jesus feeding the multitudes, they would have all had the, the feels of that familiar family story coming to them once again. Amidst the memories of the stories that they grew up with, someone would chime in and say, well, this reminds me about that story when God freed those early Israelites from Pharaoh's grasp, parting the waters, leading them to wander in the desert. They did not have any food there. They were hungry, so hungry in the wilderness. But God gave them enough for everyone. It was manna from heaven. Morning by morning, they saw new mercies of food that were there for them once again. And then someone else would say, you know, this story also reminds me of that story I remember about Elisha. It was that time when a man brought some loaves and some ears of grain to that prophet, and Elisha told the man to give the food to the crowd. The man said, well, how can I, with so little food, to be able to feed so many people? But Elisha promised that, that there would be leftovers, and there were. As that story ended, after another quiet moment, the Christian family looked around at each other to see who would share something else, another story of how God provided for God's people Christ's miracle about the loaves and the fishes, when you listen with the ears of your heart, comes that constant and consistent rhythm of God's story who continually gives love and care. 
The family story is here as well with reminders that in Christ's presence, God's intent comes with him to feed hungry people. Jesus, having just heard about the death of his cousin John, he wanted to rest. He wanted to have a chance to grieve. So he went to a deserted place. Though he was not able to remain there by himself for very long, the crowds followed him. And though not giving Jesus any alone time to himself, Jesus still had the energy to love them nonetheless. On the other side of the lake, he received these followers with compassion, and he taught them, and he cured their sick. It had been a long day. One would imagine that Jesus would have been the exhausted one. However, the story, as Matthew tells us, well, it was the disciples who were growing a little testy as the hours went on. They came to Jesus and said this to him, This is a deserted place. As if Jesus did not know. And now the hour as late. As if Jesus didn't know that either. And then they say, Send them away, Jesus, so that they may go into the surrounding country and the villages, and so that they may buy something for themselves. Now that was a compassionate plan, at least from the perspective of those disciples. It looks like the disciples care about the world to send them away so they can go and buy something to eat for themselves. And yet it's easy to wonder if they were only caring about themselves. After all, they were tired too. Well, Jesus could have been appreciative of that request from the disciples. Well, thank you, disciples. I I got a bit carried away here. I didn't know at what time it was. It got away from me. It's late. We are in a deserted place. I wasn't aware. Of course, we need to come up with a plan. Let's send them away. Let's take care of ourselves now. We'll get back to it tomorrow. But that's not what Jesus does. Now, he could have said something like this if he wanted to be sarcastic. However, his response is altogether different. Now, Matthew says that there are 5,000 men. At that time, they only counted the men, not the women and children. And so, scholars think that we should really at least triple that number. There is Jesus looking out over what may be 15 to 20,000 people. And then he looks to 12. Just the 12. Only 12 people. And Jesus turns to them and he says, you are the ones that I want you to go and give them all something to eat. But Jesus, we've looked around, they said. We've only seen about five loaves, a couple of fish, To let everyone here eat? Well, we'd need manna from heaven. We'd need Elisha's powers of plenty to divide the food. In short, Jesus, we'd need a miracle. And then Jesus says, now you're getting the idea. This morning in Matthew's Gospel, we stumble upon one of those family stories in the Bible. But this time, Jesus tells the story a bit differently. Typically, the story of God provides for the people in a manner where God is doing all of the work. However, this time, when the disciples come to Jesus looking for a plan, Jesus tells them that they are the ones who are to go and give food for the people who are there to be able to eat. There's not a miraculous sign from the sky. Jesus doesn't raise his hand as the bread levitates up and and magically floats to the mouths of all of those gathered. No, this time Jesus sends the disciples out with some baskets and some fish to show God's handiwork to the multitudes. 
Just when it seems as though the day has been too long, everyone is tired and grumpy, and there's nothing left to give, Jesus hands his followers the baskets and says, I still have work for you to do. As the saying goes, there's no rest for the weary. But if we look closely at what is happening here, Jesus does not do the work of providing food for the hungry. Instead, Jesus gives his miraculous work to the church. Jesus chooses his friends to take something small, to share his gifts, and to go to everyone with his presence. Go out with the baskets, and you will be my presence out among the multitudes. Share these fish as a sign and a symbol of the abundance of God whose ability never ends. Break off pieces of bread, and then break off more, and then break off even more so that everyone gets their fill because I am the bread of life. And those who come to me will never go hungry. Now, this week I realize that we're about to do something this morning that we have not likely done before. Never in my years of coming to church was I ever asked to bring my own bread and grape juice for communion. It's just not done. Frankly, I, feel about, I felt a bit funny in asking you to do that last week, in preparing your own communion elements for today. Now, others usually prepare communion for worship. Those steadfast and stalwart members of the church who come in early to put together our plates in the morning. I remember as a child, I used to sneak into the church kitchen and eat the little pieces of bread that were in the freezer. I knew that they were always there because somebody had done the work of cutting them up and placing them there just for communion. Our tradition says that the elders and the deacons do the work bringing the sacrament to us, to our seats, so that we might then serve each other, a symbol of our same place in God's eyes. So maybe this morning you cut up a little square of white bread. Perhaps you tore a chunk of a loaf off at home. Possibly you made a a special trip to the store for some grape juice. Or maybe you are using this opportunity to interpret Jesus' words literally about drinking wine. Bet you didn't think about that one this morning, did you? Of course, we're all doing this for a reason. We want to keep each other safe. So we listen to the pastor and we come to the church with something additional this morning. I wonder though, did you ask yourself whether your bread and your juice are sufficient enough to bring to this holy meal? I know I did. Some bread and juice that I got at Aldi's? This can become the body and blood of the Savior of the universe? How can anything that I bring, much less something so simple, be of any real use to God? I wonder if five people got up that morning and put a loaf of bread in their pocket, and one got up and grabbed a couple of fish, and whether they had any clue in doing those relatively simple and mundane actions that morning, what Jesus was going to do with their gifts. But then come the familiar words of the family story. Jesus took that bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples And he said, take and eat, this is my body that is broken for you. And whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And even with something so small, I wonder, 
what God has in store for you. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.